Christ, the coming of the promised Messiah all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament. So the verse that I want to begin in is Luke chapter number 2, look at verse number 4. We'll read this quickly. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and, there, and they were sore afraid. Probably the most precious words ever spoken in the Bible are the next two verses here. Verse 10, verse, uh, or verses, I'm sorry, verse 10 and 11. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The title of the sermon this morning is The Greatest Gift Ever Given. The Greatest Gift Ever Given. I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that the greatest gift that has ever been given to mankind is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the coming of the Messiah. Now, I'm going to do this strategically in a few different points. Just because it's Christmas doesn't mean you're not going to learn anything this morning. Turn over to Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23. Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23. Now, of course, Christmas <coughs> is a time that we set aside where we bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ as our Savior specifically. And it should be a time, and the purpose of it really should be, the end goal should be a time where we magnify Him more and we become more grateful for what He has done. Now I want you to look here in Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23. The Bible says this, For the wages of sin... Is death. Now, a wage, of course, is something that you deserve. It's something that you have earned. The Bible says the wages of sin. So because we sin, we deserve death. But then it says this. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Notice it contrasts the wages with the gift. The wages is what you really deserve. That's what you really deserve. You know, if, if, if you were to be given... What you should be given, you would receive death. You would receive death. We would, of course, go to hell, which is a terrible, terrible thing. And that is the first point in what makes the gift so great. When we, you know, we give out gifts on Christmas to our children, a lot of times they're just desiring things that they want, aren't they? They're just looking for something that they want. They're looking for something you know, that can further their hobby, <laughs> even adults, right? They just want a gun. They just want this. They just want that, right? They're just wanting something that can further their hobby. But the gift that we were given by the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life, was a gift that we were in need of. It was something that was necessary for us. It was something that we had to have. Otherwise, we would have received death. Otherwise, we would receive death. We would go. We would burn in hell. I want you to look at Romans chapter number 5, verse number 8. Romans chapter number 5. Verse number 8. If you've ever been, and I don't know if you have been in this situation, but I'm sure this has happened to many people. Maybe you have been at the time of Christmas, or maybe even any time throughout the year. You've been in need of something, very much so, right? You've been in need of something maybe at the time of Christmas, as I said, for example. And you receive a couple of gifts from other people, but there's something very much so that you need. Maybe you're not able to pay a bill. Maybe you're not able to pay your mortgage. Maybe you're not able to pay your car payment. But then all of a sudden, one person doesn't only give you a gift card to Olive Garden. Maybe they give you, and you're in need of $200 to pay your bills, and they give you $200. I bet you care a lot more about that gift than you did the other gifts. I bet, you, I bet what meant more to you, or what should have meant more to you, was what actually met your need. What you were actually in need of. And that's the number one point, which is why we should be very appreciative or very grateful to God and what He has given us 
is because salvation was not just something, oh, it's just a bonus. Oh, it's just a plus. I'm just happy. You know, no, it's something that you are in need of. Yeah. We need that's why it's put in stark contrast with our consequences. This is actually what I should give you. This is actually what you deserve. These are your wages, right? But this is what I'm going to give you as a gift. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. <coughs> the Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us. Now, a very simple definition of the word command means to show. But a more specific definition of the word command means to prove. To prove something. So God showed his love, but specifically, he really proved that he loved us, right? But God commended his love toward us in that, so this is how that he proved it, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what we are in deserving of, what we deserve is hell. What we deserve is death. What we deserve is to die a physical death and a second death. But what makes that so much greater, the gift, is because when you actually understand this is something that you are in need of, it is necessary, you have to have salvation. Otherwise, you would die and go to hell. Now, I want you to go to, uh, I want you to turn to, actually, stay right here. Let's look while we're here in Romans chapter number 5. I want to define, before we move any further, I want to define for you what a gift actually is. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand today. They actually don't understand the definition of a gift. When you point it out to them, it becomes very obvious. But a lot of people don't really understand the definition of a gift. Now, I want you to look in verse number 15. Notice what it says in verse number 15. The Bible says this, But not as the offense, <coughs> so also is the what? Free. free gift. Notice that. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of many, for, if the, for the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Look at verse number 16 again. And not as it was, was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. Look at this. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Turn over to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. A gift, by definition, is free. A gift, by definition, has to be free, or it is not a gift any longer. God is just being explicitly clear. God is being almost to the point of redundant just to make sure that you know what a gift actually is. And a gift is free. That's the second point why we should be grateful, is that it's free. God did not allow us to earn it. God did not tell us to earn it. We couldn't earn it. So God gave it to us free. That's why it is a gift. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8. The Bible says, <coughs> For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you know what Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8 and 9 is explaining? It's explaining that it's free, that you don't pay anything for it. He tells you that it is a gift. It's actually just repeating itself. When it's saying it's by grace through faith and not of yourself, that's saying it is a gift. That's why he says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift. He's saying it's not of yourselves. You're not earning it. You're not doing anything for it. It's a gift. Therefore, you don't, you don't deserve it. It is free. Amen. A gift, by definition, is free. Amen. How much do you have to pay for something in order for it not to be a, be a gift? Anything. Anything at all. What if I said, you know, you know, you can purchase my van. No one would probably be interested. But what if I said you can purchase my van for a thousand dollars. I want to give you my van as a gift, Brother Russell, for a thousand bucks. Would that be a gift? It's ridiculous. What if I even said I'll give you my van as a gift for a dollar? It's not a gift. It doesn't matter how much you pay for it at all. If you try to earn it at all, it's no longer a gift. What if I gave my van to Brother Russell and Brother Russell was like, okay, well, I just want to give you a hundred dollars for it. That right there also makes it not a gift, does it? No, no, no. If you want to maybe pay me back out of gratitude, that's fine, but don't pay me for the van at all. Right. Don't give me any money for the van at all. So the, the, one of the great things about what God has given to us is that it is a gift. And, of course, because it's a gift, it is a free gift. Right. 
I want you to turn to another passage here. I want you to go to go to Romans chapter number 8, verse number 32. <coughs> Excuse me, that's Romans chapter 8, verse number 32. I'll read you another verse about the gift being free, about salvation being free. It says in Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And then he says this, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Notice both elements, both of the two, the first two points that I've mentioned in this sermon were found right there. He says, I will give unto him that is a thirst. So notice this person is in need of something, isn't he? Referring, obviously, to salvation, of course. He says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life for a small cost. No, he says, freely. It's free. And, it's, and it tastes that much better because you're thirsty. <clears throat> so I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 8, verse number 32. This is the third point of why this is the greatest gift that's ever given. Why this is the greatest gift that is ever given is because <clears throat> it's a package deal. Number one, as I mentioned already, <clears throat> God loves us and the gift that he gave us was actually saving us from our sins. It's actually deliverance from our sins. A part of the gift is that he's not giving us what we deserve. He's not giving us what we deserve. But do you know what else he does is he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just save us from hell. He doesn't just save us and deliver us from our sins. He actually gives us good things. He actually freely and, and a part of that same gift gives us blessings. I want you to look at Romans chapter number 8, verse number 32. Romans chapter number 8, verse number 32. The Bible says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also, look at this, freely give us all things. Notice that. So how much do we have to pay for it? Nothing. So what does that make it, what he's giving us? If it's free, it's what? It's a gift. It's a gift. That's the definition of something being free. Saying that he will freely give us all things. All things. Saying that we will inherit all things with Jesus. We'll be given all things with the Christ. So he redeems us freely. We do nothing for it. We don't pay for it at all. We actually <coughs> deserve a punishment. And he, he comes and he redeems us, as I said. He dies for us. He takes our punishment upon himself. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, you know what? I'm also part of the same gift. I'm going to just freely give you all things. I'm going to freely give you everything. What do we get? we get? We get to live in paradise. We get to be known as a son of God. We get to live and dwell with God Almighty forever in a perfect place where there's no sin, there's no sorrow, a perfect place. So not only does he save us and just and, and, and present something unto us or just not give us anything in addition to that at all, he saves us and he also gives us all things. He also gives us many great things. He blesses us a part of that. So that is a part, it's a package deal, it's a package gift. I want you to look at John chapter number 8, verse number 23. John chapter number 8, verse number 23. John chapter number 8, verse number 23. The next point that proves that this is the greatest gift that's ever given and that will help you to be grateful for the gift of salvation is understanding what the giver has to sacrifice for it. Is understanding what the giver has to sacrifice for it. Now, if, if you knew that someone really had to sacrifice a lot just for a very basic present that was given unto you, wouldn't that make you more appreciative before it? Wouldn't that make you appreciate that gift and be much more grateful for that gift? Well, look here first. I want you to look at John chapter number 8, verse number 23. I'm going to spend some time on this real quick. John chapter number 8, verse number 23. Jesus says this. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. He says, Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I want to focus on that for a minute. Go to Philippians chapter number 2. Go to Philippians chapter number 2. So notice, of course, and everyone here, of course, being saved, you have to believe that Jesus is God. You have to believe that Jesus is God in the flesh and understanding that God forsook paradise. 
that God gave up paradise. He left a throne in heaven. He left a crown. He left all the great things and the glory that he had in heaven. And he came and he was born in a manger. If you're paying close attention there in Luke 2, if you've read the story of Matthew, of course, as well, he was born in a manger. Now, a lot of people may not be familiar. It's not a word that we use very often. But they may not be familiar with the word manger or what a manger actually is. A word that we use in place of manger very often today in our modern vernacular is trough. That's a word that we would use today, a trough. And this is, this is a storage container you know, for animals' food. That's why when you look at the nativity scenes, what you see is Jesus, the baby Jesus, lying on top of hay. Because that's supposed to be him being born in a trough or in a manger. He was born, you know, where animals would feed out of. He was born in a barn. Now, does that sound very glorious? Does that sound where you would expect a king to be born? This was a perfect sign. Obviously, God, you know, providentially and divinely worked out the way in which he would be born. Because when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he did not live the life of a king. When Jesus Christ came to this earth... He lived the life of a servant. He really, in a lot of ways, lived the life of what a, a, lot of, a lot of people, and he purposely did this, the life of a servant or the life of a peasant. I want you to look at Philippians chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 5. He lived a humble life. It says this in verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, I also want to explain this passage because it's a little bit confusing to a lot of people. A lot of people will say that this is speaking of, you know, this other person that's seated beside God the Father and then he comes down. I'm going to explain to you that, that this is actually talking about the life of Jesus Christ. Number one, in verse number five, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Past tense, referring to the time in which he lived, on the earth. Let this mind be in you that he's explaining, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, hey, let, me, let me ask this question to you quickly. What would you have in common with God while he was in heaven? A lot or not very much? Nothing. But what would you have in common with God when he comes down and has to live on this earth as a man? So wouldn't it make much more sense that he's actually paralleling with you and giving you an example of God when he's living as a man right now? Saying, let this mind be in you, which was, past tense, also in Christ Jesus. This is after, of course, Jesus Christ had died and lived his life on this earth as a man. So it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being, the past participle, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Thought is past tense, right? It's saying, while he lived on this earth, he was in the form of God. Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Bible says that he was the image, specifically the flesh, the body that he had was the image of the invisible God. He was in the form of God. When you look at the word form, it's always talking about visibly what you look at. God does not have a physical form in that sense. The way in which God becomes known to us is through the man Christ Jesus, through the body and the flesh that he took upon himself. He is the image, the Bible says, of the invisible God, the man Christ Jesus being born, God as a man. So he's saying he was in the form of God, and at that very, <coughs> very, very same time, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know the only other time in the Bible in which it talks about Jesus being equal with God, do you know when that is? It's when he's living upon this earth as a man. It's when he's living upon this earth as a man, God as a man. And the Pharisees say, because he said he was the Son of God, thou being a man, makest thyself equal with God. So what was the statement that he said? It proved that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So is this something that took place while he was in heaven or while he was on earth? while he was on earth. He, being in the form of God, he was, the, he was the representation of God. He was the image of God. He was God in the flesh. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but look, but made himself, so at that very time, while he was living on the earth, <coughs> he made himself of no reputation. Where was he born? In a manger. What type of job did he have? 
He was a carpenter, the Bible tells you. He made himself of no reputation. What did he do? He went around just serving people all the time. He washed his disciples' feet. He made himself. He lived a humble life. He made himself of no reputation. Look at this. And took upon him the form of a servant. So he's in the form of God. He looks like God as far as his flesh, right? He has the, 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 the figure, the form of God. But when you look at him, how did he live his life? The form of a servant, didn't he? He appeared as a servant. When you looked at him, he lived the life of a servant. And took upon him the form of a servant. He chose to do this. It's saying the same thing again. He made himself of no reputation and... So him while on this earth, he made himself of no reputation of something he chose to do. The man Christ Jesus, God in the flesh, he chose to do this. It says it was made in the likeness of man. What's that mean? He's acting just like everyone else. He's making himself of no reputation. He is God in the flesh. But what does he do? He makes himself in the likeness of man. He acts like just everybody else, doesn't he? He humbles himself. He humbled himself for us. The creator of all the earth. God, who he doesn't need anything to sustain him at all. He doesn't require you. He doesn't need you for anything. He spoke this world into existence just by his very breath. He created this vast universe. That same, that very same God came down and was born on this earth as a man. I mean, isn't that just the most amazing thing in the world? Amen. God who is eternal, He is infinite, He has all power, He can do anything that He desires, anything that He wants, He became a baby. A baby that you can hold and you can look down. I mean, just imagine. You know, He took on Him, He, he truly became a man. And even when He became a man, did He live the life of just like God as a man, of what you would expect? No, He didn't. What did He do? He could have done that, couldn't he? He was, you know, he was in the form of God. But what did he choose to do? To be made in the likeness of men. To, to make himself of no reputation. He, what did he do? He took upon him the form of a servant. God as a man. This is the mind that he had. This is the mindset that he had. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. So understanding what he actually gave up for us. There isn't, <coughs> there is not a single person that it's possible for them to sacrifice more. For. This, this alone proves that this is the greatest gift ever given. Because no one has what God has. No one has as much of, of anything. God possesses all things. He possesses everything. He is the Lord of Lords, the God of God. You know what he did? He took everything and set it aside and became a man. He became a man, and not only did he become a man, he did not live according to the things that he could have had. You know, the things that he could have had as being God as a man. What did he do? He made himself of no reputation. He made himself. Not only did he live a humble life, I want you to turn to, uh, go to Matthew chapter number 26. Not only did he live a humble life, but of course, as is mentioned there, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He suffered and he died for us. I'm going to read you a quick about Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 20. Jesus making himself of no reputation. Jesus being made in the likeness of men. It says this, And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Notice that. He doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. He's just traveling around. Why? Because he's serving people. This is the same Lord that says that he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. But he makes himself no reputation while he lives as a man on this earth. <coughs> I want to look at the sufferings of Christ quickly. The sufferings of Christ. I'm going to read to you from a couple of verses that speak about this. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 10. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 10 says, For it became him... For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. First Peter chapter number one, verse number eleven says, "Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory 
that should follow. Look at, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to read you also from 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness. So he saw this, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I want you to look out in Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 65. Matthew 26, 65 is a portion of the sufferings of Christ that he went through while on this earth, while being obedient to the death of the cross. It says this, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need we? What further need have we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Now verse 67, Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands. These people are spitting on him and buffeting him. They're hitting him. And it says they smote him with the palms of their hands. Say they have their hands open. And they're just hitting him in the face with the palms of their hands. And then look at verse 68 when they mock him. Saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Who is he? That smote thee. So they obviously have his head covered in some way or whatever. They have his head down and they're spitting on him. Or maybe he, he can't even open his eyes at this point. Maybe they tied something around his eyes. And they're hitting him. They're hitting him where he's not able to see who it is. And then they're mocking him. Do they think that he can tell them? They're saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Tell us, who was it that hit you? Who was it that smote you? How hard did it have to be? Because he could have at any moment said... It was that guy right there. Couldn't he? At, at any moment. How hard did it have to be? Just showing, again, that same example of what he had to give up. The God of the universe. The God of the universe was standing there while his creation, he willingly put himself into subjection to his creation, and they spit on him, and they mocked him, and they smote him in the face, and they hit him repeatedly. This is only a small portion of Christ's sufferings. I want you to turn... I want you to turn to, uh, go to Isaiah chapter number 53. This, is, this chapter is known as the suffering servant. The suffering servant. Now, <coughs> the word passion, passion in its singular form is only used one time. And uh, does anybody in here, <coughs> honestly, does anyone know what the word passion means? In the Bible. Anyone at all? Elijah, you have no idea. Just put your hand down. Does anyone know what the word passion means? I've never heard a single person explain this. The word passion actually means suffering. You can find this from James chapter number 5, is the way that I discovered it. Because the word passion, when it's used, and you may be familiar with it, is in Acts 1-3. And it's, it talks about, you know, after his passion, he, he, uh, he uh, appeared unto many, something along those lines. Talking about after his suffering, he appeared unto many. Now, if you look in James chapter 5, I'm not going to turn there right now, but it talks about how Elias was a man subject to, to like passions. Something along those lines, right? And it's talking about he's subject unto like tribulations. He's subject unto like temptations or trials. He, it's talking about Elias' sufferings that he went through. Anyone heard of uh, you know, uh, patropassionism? Heard of that before? That, what does that mean? It's, someone, it's a doctrine that, some, that people would believe that the Father suffered. That's what that's saying. Patropassionism. It comes from the word passion, and the word pas patra is like father, right? It's like a patriarch is a father, or, you know, paternal father. And passionism means to suffer. So in Acts 1-3, it's talking about his suffering. That's what that's actually talking about, the sufferings that Christ went through. And after his sufferings, he entered into his glory. That phrase is used all throughout the Bible. You know, uh, where it will speak of his sufferings. Ought not Christ to have suffered and, and to enter into his glory? I just thought of that one. That's in Luke when Jesus is rebuking the two men on the road to Emmaus. So it talks about the suffering and then the glory. That's why in Acts 1-3, it says, you know, after his passion, he appeared unto many. So that's the suffering and then he's appearing unto many and then he enters into his glory. He goes to heaven. That's what the word passion in the Bible means. It's actually talking about... His suffering. Christ's suffering is spoken of a lot. It's spoken of a lot. But Isaiah chapter number 53 gives us <coughs> the most specific details on Christ's suffering for us. I want you to look at Isaiah 52 though first. Verse 13. Because the context of the suffering servant does not begin just in Isaiah 53. 
It begins in Isaiah 52, and look at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. 14, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. What the Bible is teaching you here, his visage is referring to his, his, his visage as his visual, what he looks like, his face, right? It says that his visage was more marred. What does it mean to mar something? It means to, to damage it in some way, right? It says that his visage was more marred more than any man. More than any man. He goes on to say, <coughs> and his form more than the sons of men. Saying he was beaten more than any man. This implies to me that he was possibly, his face, maybe when they were buffeting him, he was beaten more than any man had been beaten. More than any man maybe ever had been beaten. That's how bad he was beaten. His visage was so marred. I want you to go skip down. Let's look at <coughs> um, 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now look at verse 3. It starts going into his suffering. He is despised and rejected of men. Keep in mind that this is what Christ had to go through in order to present you with the gift that he gave you. This is what he had to do to give you your gift. Look at what it says in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. <coughs> verse 4. Surely he hath borne our grief, saying he carried our griefs. He took our problems upon himself and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Speaking of course that he took our punishment. He wasn't dying on the cross for his own sins. Jesus Christ was sinless. He was God in the flesh. And because of that, he could then willingly take our punishment upon himself. He is who healed us by his stripes, him being beaten. So what if he would have never been beaten? You would have never been healed. Those stripes were necessary in order for him to give you the gift of salvation. He had to hang it. In order, if you wanted to be saved, this is what he had to go through for you. Look at verse number 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And what did we see in Matthew chapter 26? Just a glimpse of that. They're telling him, prophesy unto us that thou, that thou art the Christ. Tell us. Now which one of us hit you? What did he do? He stood there and didn't say a word. Just stood there allowed just to punch him in the face, hit him in the face, beat him to the point where they couldn't even recognize him. Couldn't even see who he was any longer. Look at verse, verse uh, 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? Look at verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich <coughs> in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, I want to focus on that for a minute. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now you may or may not have noticed this, but notice it says at the very beginning, let's read it one more time at the beginning of verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Christ's passion or Christ's suffering did not end on the cross. His soul was also made an offering for sin. Go to Acts chapter number 2, verse number 38. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 38. Actually, I'm sorry, it's not verse 38. 
Let's go to Acts chapter number 2, verse 31. Yeah. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 31. Chapter number two, verse number thirty-eight. No one has ever paid. I'm oh, sorry, verse thirty-one. I saw Brother Rick smile. I'm so used to going to that lately because we've been on that topic for so long. Acts chapter number two, verse number thirty-one. Now, no one has ever paid as much for a gift than the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only because of what He gave up, but also because of the sacrifice. He not only He, he did not only see. Here's the thing: there are many people that are going to die. You know, maybe even there are people, many people throughout history, I'm sure, that died on a cross for sins, but it was for their own sins. They were crucified, right? But they weren't bearing the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he was bearing the sins of every single person that has ever lived. So no person has ever paid the cost that Christ paid. But not only that, he didn't only die a physical death for you. He didn't only die on the cross. He died, and a lot of people may not know this, but he died and he went to hell and he took our punishment also in hell. Notice it said that his soul was made an offering for sin. There will also be many people that go to hell, of course, right? But they're only paying for the sins of one person. Christ died on the cross for the sins of the whole world and he went to hell and he paid the sins of the whole world in hell. I want you to look at Acts chapter number 2, verse number 31. The Bible says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell. Notice it says his soul, talking about Christ's soul, that his soul was not left in hell. In order for something not to be left somewhere, what you're saying is that it was there, and then you took it out. His soul was not left in hell, because what happened three days and three nights later? He rose again. His soul and his spirit entered back into his body just to prove here that, that hell actually means hell and it's not Hades or Sheol or some place of the dead. Look at the contrast in the latter part of the verse. So he says his soul is not left in hell, neither. So are we talking about the same thing or something different? Something different, aren't we? Neither his flesh did see corruption. His soul went to hell, but because he rose again, his soul didn't stay in hell, and also his flesh didn't corrupt because his soul left hell, entered back into his body, and he physically walked out of the tomb. Amen. Physically rose again from the dead. I mean, how much more could somebody pay for somebody? Seriously. Right. They took the sins of the entire world, the punishment, and God is a just God. So whatever punishment that Christ took on that cross was truly perfectly balanced for what? Everyone that has ever lived, all of their sins upon that cross. Think about that concept. Because he's a just God, he understands perfect justice. And he knows exactly what Josh Hall deserves, exactly what Brother Bob deserves, exactly what every person in here deserves. He took those sins of every person that has ever lived and he hung them upon Jesus. The exact punishment of what he deserved. Then, the exact punishment that every person deserved, he took it to hell. For three days and three nights, he paid that punishment. Think about that for a minute. It's mind-boggling. Yeah. You know why? It's just by this point alone, it is the greatest gift that can ever be given. Amen. Amen. Because of what he had to pay in order to give it to you. Right. Right. Matthew 12:40 says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The heart is not a tomb carved down the side of a mountain. That's not what he was referring to. The heart of something is like the heart of an avocado. It's the core. It's the center of it. What is in the center of the earth? Fire. Ask any supposed scientist. There's one thing they got right at least, right? There's burning hot magma. Discovered thousands of years later, there's burning hot magma, fire and brimstone, exactly what God told and prophesied was what was in the heart of the earth thousands of years ago. Ephesians 4, 7, but unto every one of us, listen to this, perfect, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Amen. He descended first into the lower parts of the earth. Do a, a research on the word if you like. 
what lower parts of the earth is referring to every time in the Old Testament. It says, in the same verse, quite a few times, hell, lower parts of the earth, hell, lower parts of the earth, repeatedly. Romans 10, 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring that is to bring Christ down from above. Verse 7, or who shall descend into the deep? Notice, lower parts of the earth, the deep, the heart of the earth, hell. Over and over again. Very clear. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. In Revelation 1, when Jesus Christ appears after he rose again to John, what does he tell him that he has? The keys. The keys of death and hell. He has the keys of hell and of death, doesn't he? How did he get them? Because he went there. Because he conquered death and he conquered hell. It's the greatest gift ever given just by that point alone, what he was willing to pay for us. So number one, it's the greatest gift that is ever given because it is something that we are in need of. Not only is it something that we are in need of, it's something that you need more than anything in the world. Whether you realize it or not, whether you go knock on somebody's door and they're not interested, what they need more than anything is this gift. Amen. They may not realize it, they may not know it, they may not be interested, but that doesn't matter. Whether or not, let's say this, they may, they may be in need of you know, a cancer treatment, but just because somebody says, I don't want that, and I'm not interested in that, and I don't think that I have cancer, and I don't need that, it means nothing. The gift that every person that is in need of, more than anything, is the gift of salvation. Amen. The greatest gift that was ever given. Number two, of course, because it's free. It's free. All gifts are free by de definition. Number three, <coughs> it's a package deal. Not only does he save us from the worst punishment that can ever be given, he gives us the, ble the best blessings that anyone can ever be offered or ever Amen. be given. Verse number, or uh, point number four was the, the, the sufferings that he went through. The sufferings that he went through were far greater than any person has ever suffered for anything ever. His suffering in this life, he made himself with no reputation. He lived the life of a servant. He was looked down upon. He was mistreated his entire life for you to give you that gift. Not only did he live the humble life, but he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He took the sins upon himself and bore the sorrows and the griefs and all the trouble and everything on the cross. But then not only that, does it in there, he went to hell for three days and three nights. A lot of people don't preach that, but you know what? Maybe people would be a lot more grateful for their salvation if more pastors stood up and preached. Right. That Jesus Christ loved you so much, it didn't end on the cross. He died and he burned in hell for three days and three nights. What you deserve. If you ask a random person, hey, what's the punishment... Uh, for sinning against God. Where do they go? Hell. Well, common sense. That if Jesus came to take our punishment, what does he have to do? It's that simple. The Old Testament, they offered a lamb, right? They would kill the lamb. What did the lamb represent? Jesus. What did they do after they killed the lamb? They burned the lamb. The whole purpose of that was it did not take away their sins. The Bible is abundantly clear about that. It was just a figure or be a type or picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Amen. Whether or not Jesus Christ went to hell is not a question. It's extremely, extremely clear in the Bible. All right. <clears throat> but number five, we'll look at two verses real quick. They're in the same chapter, John chapter number 10. Number five is because this gift is an eternal gift. It really and truly is a gift that keeps on giving. It's a gift that just keeps on giving. You've heard people say that, I'm sure. I want you to look first in John chapter number 10, verse number 28. The Bible says, And I give unto them eternal life. So we're all dead in our sin, right? Fact, once we sin against the Lord Jesus Christ, once we sin against God's commandments, we're dead in our sins. We're dead. But notice he says he doesn't just give us life. Does he just bring us back to life? What sort of life is this? It's eternal life. He could just say, if this life you could lose, what would he say? I'm going to give you life. But he doesn't say that. He could just give you life just in general. He could just bring you back to life. He said, no, you got it. No. There's a reason why he calls it eternal life. Look at what it says next. And I give unto them eternal life. Why? And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. If you remember Romans chapter number 6, verse number 23, we read first, our opening text. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the gift of God. It is eternal life. I want you to look at verse number 10, and then we'll end here. Chapter number 10, verse number 10. 
The, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The time of Christmas is time to dwell on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The birth of Jesus. And you know, the most important thing of everything that I, that I went over was the fact of what Jesus Christ was willing to give for us. Who pays for a gift? The giver or the receiver? The giver. The giver. The giver pays for the gift and then he presents it to you. He paid more for this gift than anybody will ever pay. It doesn't matter. You can possess every, you know, every dollar in, in every, you know, currency, every form of money in every currency, and you can never even put a dent in what the Lord Jesus Christ paid in order to give you salvation. Amen. It's the greatest gift that has ever been given. You can Amen. never top it no matter what. It is the greatest gift that, that could ever be given. And this is what you should do. During Christmas time, you should dwell upon what that gift cost it. I don't want to, it's great, you know, it's, it, obviously at this time we think about the Lord Jesus Christ being born in the manger, but that was only the beginning of the good tidings. I'm glad he didn't stay a baby. You know what I mean? I'm glad he didn't just stay a baby forever. You know, I'm glad that he grew up and he paid the cost for my sins. He came, that, that just represented, was that was the good tidings that were going to be coming. When we, when we, Christmas, when we, when, when we, we, uh, you know, we think about Jesus being a baby and being born in, in Bethlehem's manger, that's just the beginning of the greatest story ever told. You know what you should really think about is all the things that he, that he gave to give you that gift. And you know what that should do for you? It should make you more grateful. Amen. It should make you want to, want to pay him back. Not, not to pay him back for your salvation in order to try to deserve it or earn it, because you can never earn it. That's right. But just do, just here's the thing. You should live your life understanding, I could never pay him back for what he did, but you know what? I'm going to try to make him as happy, and I'm going to try to please him the best that I can in my life. Amen. I'm going to do the most for him. I know that I could never pay him back. I could never do for myself what he did for me. But you know what? I am just going to, I am just going to work my entire life trying to please God the best that I can for what he did for me. Amen. That's what we should do. The greatest gift ever been. Be grateful during Christmas time for the greatest gift ever given. Let's bow our heads and work for it. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the greatest gift ever given. We thank you that you're willing to sacrifice your son. Dear Lord, we thank you, dear God, that you died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. We ask you that you would that you would bless us and be with us in this Christmas season, dear Lord, that you would help us not to be caught up with all of the the nonsense that's a part of Christmas, but help us just to focus on your word and on your birth and on the salvation that was given, the greatest gift that was ever given to us. We thank you so much for everything that you went through, the punishment that you took for us, dear God, and help us just to spend our lives, uh, dear God, just, just trying to, to, to please you and to make you happy, to do whatever we can for you. Just be with us and bless us during this time, as I said, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.